Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Doug Brown. I'm the Chief Exec of the British Society for Immunology. And I'm very sorry that I can't be there with you today in virtual real person. Um, unfortunately, uh, I had a, a, an urgent family issue that uh, I have to see to. So uh, um, uh, I hope it's okay with you, but you have uh, my recording of the presentation that I was due to uh, give you at the seminar this afternoon. So very sorry that I uh, can't be there, but very pleased that the technology is bringing me there in one way or another. So um, to let me start my presentation, let me just share my screen and the presentation I'm going to give you. Um, which is here. And um, I've got a few slides to um, present that just takes um, you through uh, what the BSI is, who we are, what we do, and specifically what we've been doing in that One Health, One Medicine space that um, is the theme, of course, for today's uh, seminar. And then some thoughts and reflections on next steps that uh, we feel would be important for uh, the immunology space, but also in One Health in general. So who are we as the BSI? And let me just move this icon so you can see who we are. Um, we are a charity and we operate across the world, even though we are based in the UK and we are the British Society for Immunology, but we do interact with uh, many individuals and organizations um, across the world on immunology matters. Our vision, our mission, is here at the top corner of the screen. And essentially it's to do with really anything in immunology. Um, and that means anything for animal and human immunology. So our, our vision is looking for better health, health for all through immunology. Say so that's not just people, not just humans, but animals as well. And our mission is really looked to support the immunology community to help drive scientific discovery and make a positive impact on health. So again, that is human and animal health. Um, in the centre here, we have a, a wonderful diagram which uh, really pulls together our strategy as it stands at the moment. And there are three main elements to our strategy, connecting community, championing careers and catalyzing change. The connected community is really looking at uh, doing pretty much what it says on the tin um, and as much as we can working across the immunology community all of the different sectors, all of the different research disciplines and career stages to bring um, group either all together or to bring groupings of them together, together around similar interests to try and support that collaboration, support that co-working uh, to enable the researchers to get the best out of their research and other work in immunology. The second area is championing careers. So this is very important to us and this is lifelong career support. So not just those coming through university, postgraduate PhDs and early career researchers, but also those later on in their career journeys to be able to get the support from us, but also provide their support back to those that are, that are earlier on in their careers. And, and we've got a lot of initiatives that supports people, again, in all of those different sectors that we work across. And then there's catalyzing change, which is um, really, in a nutshell, the, the work and the influencing that we can do as the British Society for Immunology on behalf of our members to tweak, to modify, to change, to build the environment that will allow immunology research and work in immunology to thrive, to deliver better outcomes for health for animal and human health. So there's um, a lot that we're doing in this space. And again, I'll come on to this a little bit more um, in more detail in a couple of slides time. So this is the BSI and um, we're known as a learner society. And I'm sure many of you will understand what a learner society is, but there's a definition that I pulled off uh, from a trusty um, uh, Google search. And I mean, in all honesty, a learner society is quite a, could be seen as quite a stuffy or even pretentious way of describing uh, what an organization is um, like ours. Um, it, it's a historic term, not one that I'm particularly bought into, but it does essentially say what we do as an organization, which is to promote an academic discipline, 
profession or a group of uh, disciplines in uh, in science. And so our art is, of course, in science, but it can be in the arts. What does that mean for the BSI? Well, as I said, we are a charity um, as a learner society. And first and foremost, we are here for anybody working in immunology with a professional interest in immunology to join us as members of the British Society for Immunology. And that membership brings uh, various benefits, access to benefits that we provide, uh, but also a voice and influence into our work and um, the, uh, the ability to influence the direction of the BSI through membership on various committees and on our board of trustees. So first and foremost, we are a membership organization that are here to support and represent those working in immunology. And I've mentioned across different sectors, um, this is really important to us. So um, we've got lots of cross-cutting ways of, of, of looking at this. So we, we support people throughout their, their career, as I've mentioned, in uh, their research discipline across human and animal health. So anything that has anything to do with immunology is absolutely relevant, but also the different sectors. So this could be academia, this can be in the clinic, um, in industry, biotech or pharma, but in government bodies, in other charities, in uh, policy making organisations, and again, in the UK, but also worldwide, about 10% of our members are from overseas. So huge reach into all of those different sectors for anyone who has that professional interest in immunology. And as I've mentioned already, we really look to support our members to get the best out of their work. So we, we, we listen to our members and we try and develop our own areas of work that we can deliver directly, but also provide that leading voice on immunology matters to the UK, but also the rest of the world. And we've done a lot of this in vaccination, in, in COVID, of course, over the last couple of years. And I'll come on to that again in a, a little bit more detail in a second. So uh, for those of you um, there, I'm sure um, you have a very good understanding of our immune system. If anything, if you didn't before, going through the pandemic, you do. And my friends, when I got this job, they say, are you working for the British Society for who? And now I've got those same friends telling me about my B cells and my T cells with thanks to all of that promotion of uh, science during the course of the pandemic. So um, this isn't really to you know teach you to suck eggs or anything like that. It's just a, a run through of, I guess, how passionate we are about immunology and the immune system. I'm a, I'm a past immunologist, I say past, because my knowledge is a little bit out of date. I did my postdoctoral um, research in, uh, in immunology, um, but it, this is the kind of thing that gets us up in the morning. And we would say this, wouldn't we? But immun immunology and the immune system is core to our survival and is absolutely involved in pretty much any major disease that affects humans and animals. And what we've seen from the research over the years is that by understanding our immune system, we can um, achieve the things that have just flashed up on the screen. So we can understand disease even better. We can try and find ways to diagnose different conditions better, provide a prognosis through immunology. There have been development of treatments and cures, either using the immune system to deliver those treatments and cures or targeting the immune system to, to modify it to deliver that curative or, or treatment effect. And of course, um, being able to prevent different um, uh, infections or um, uh, potentially reduce your risk of various other diseases as well. So there's a lot that we have achieved from understanding our immune system, but a lot more that we can still do going forward. And if we have a look at disease areas and the, the, I guess the research areas that have been relevant to both human and animal research, they, um, they are many actually. And they, you know, just a snapshot of them here, you know, looking at, uh, at uh, cancer, for example, immunotherapies for cancer, understanding autoimmunity, vaccinations, of course, allergies, immunodeficiency, infections, transplantations, antimicrobial resistance. And there are a few emerging areas as well that if we can understand this, perhaps these uh, diseases can be targeted with an immune based approach like dementia, like some cardiovascular areas and, and, and maybe helping from an obesity perspective as well. And of course, next generation cancer immunotherapies as well. 
So lots of, of, of results we've seen from the research so far for um, human and animal health, but a lot more that we can achieve. And I think relevant to the seminar this afternoon, the, the real key here is that this is relevant to both animal and human health um, across one health, we call it. I know you're more familiar with the, the term um, one medicine, um, but this is something that um, absolutely our members are working towards. Possibly more could be done, and I come to that towards the end of my talk, but there are definitely examples of where um, we have that two-way learning between human uh, research, animal research, and, and medicine and practice, so that we can have ultimate benefit for, um, for both humans and animals. Um, so coming to our work more, more widely, and I, I guess giving you a bit more insight into how we deliver <clears throat> on that opportunity that I presented on the last slide, that, 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 that actually by working as the BSI across the community, how can we really draw out um, the, the benefits for research, for translation, clinical delivery, and ultimately human and animal health? Well, first and foremost, our, our membership is, um, is growing, which means um, partly the BSI is maybe looking a little bit more popular, uh, but also we feel the community, at least the community that is engaging with us, is growing as well. And, and we've got over 4,500 members currently. Um, that membership has nearly doubled, I would say, in the last four to five years, which has been absolutely fantastic to get that engagement, again, across the different sectors, career stages, and different um, research disciplines. We've also been very busy um, over the last couple of years from a pandemic perspective in the UK. We and our members very early on identified actually COVID-19, which is a disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, is um, in effect an immunological disorder. So it is where your immune system becomes overactive and then starts attacking different organs um, around the body in severe disease, which leads to that severe disease and death. So we um, we worked across our community to help them reorganize, uh, self-organize, but also do it in a strategic way so that we could work in three different areas, research policy and public engagement. We worked uh, from a research perspective in trying to mobilize researchers that working in different parts of immunology. Clearly they hadn't researched COVID-19 previously because it was a uh, SARS-CoV-2 was an emerging pathogen, but we had the skills and expertise out there across the UK that we could harness and pull together rapidly to, to get samples from patients, to analyze those samples and try to give us some insights into what's going on from an immunological perspective. And we managed to secure several million pounds worth of funding from UK government for a big national consortium that, um, that we uh, supported the delivery of during the pandemic, alongside a number of other pro projects and programs of work where really our role was to to bring the community together to support that, that and facilitate that collaboration and partnership working to speed up our, our discovery and our, our understanding of the, of the pandemic and, and the pathogen. Off the, off, with the back of that, um, and at the same time, we uh, worked from a policy perspective where we established an expert task force, worked with our members to um, bring the voice of immunology to the table uh, central government where policies were being developed, you know, looking at dosing schedules, looking at uh, how we can best deploy vaccines out there to the public, in particular to various different communities that uh, there are, um, looking at um, whether it's one, two, three, four doses that are needed, the type of vaccine platform, all of those things needed an immunology voice to contribute. And we were able to bring the community to those discussions. And a big part of our work was on public engagement as well, where we wanted to uh, make sure that the general public were able to access accurate, um, up-to-date, readily and freely available information about the virus, about the disease, and particularly about vaccines, so that we could be answering the common questions that are out there as they emerged um, to try and enable people to get the information that they need to be able to make the decision, hopefully, to become vaccinated. 
against COVID-19. So lots of work on the pandemic. And, and, you know, this is the type of work we've been doing in other disease areas and other research areas, but it all came together. And, and of course, a, a huge focus for us over the last couple of years, which is continuing. We've also got a number of projects that we're working on beyond COVID-19, either before, during and, and now uh, in, the, in the latter stages of the pandemic, so to speak. So we work within the autoimmunity research space, focusing on um, uh, human autoimmunity disorders, where we've brought in over a million pounds worth of funding to look at this area, not as disease silos, but actually what are those, those, those biological mechanisms at play that, that run across a number of different, different disease areas so that we can try and have a different approach to identifying new, new treatments, new ways of diagnosing and, uh, and, and other approaches. Um, also working in cancer immunology, and I'll speak to this in a little bit more detail in a second, but our veterinary vaccines report where we have been working with the, those who are working uh, improving animal health uh, with a with a, a focus, I would say, on on veterinary immunology and veterinary vaccination. Um, and I say I can talk to that a little bit more detail in a second. We've also been supporting more careers than ever before, and this is absolutely crucial and would be is crucial to uh, the One Health One Medicine approach as well. Because if we want to be pushing an area of research or encouraging it to happen, we need to be communicating this to people, at, particularly at early stages of their career, so that they see this as an attractive area to, to, to move into and to pursue a career in. So we've got uh, mentoring opportunities, we've got new career enhancing grant scheme, and lots of other things that we do to support careers to make immunology look attractive but also to give some insight into those different areas within immunology, those different sectors and the different disciplines. And we also have three academic journals, one which has been long-standing for 60 years called Clinical and Experimental Immunology, um, but also two others that we've launched in the last couple of years around immunotherapy advances and discovery immunology. They're fantastic journals, the two new ones, um, Immunotherapy Advances and Discovery Immunology, a, a pure open access, which uh, means once it's published, it's open there for, uh, from day one to the general public to be able to access, it's not behind a paywall. And, um, and within these journals, we do accept um, manuscripts looking at uh, human research, looking at animal research and One Health research as well. So I hope you agree, there's a lot that we um, look to deliver within our strategy um, and rather pleasingly, and we get this feedback from our members is that we're able to, we put our, able to put our, our resources and our minds behind this, and have the, the voice, the collective voice and the collective influence of our community. We really are able to influence change. So if we look at One Health at the BSI, as uh, we describe it, really this is underpinned by bringing all of our researchers and clinicians and others together from across immunology and really looking to promote collaboration as best we can. There, there are a number of different elements to this within the BSI and of course, um, let's remember this is just within immunology. So there are lots of other research disciplines that um, should and could and need to be working with uh, within the One Health agenda. But there are plenty of opportunities um, and, and ways that we facilitate this at the British Society for Immunology. So, um, as I say, first and foremost, through BSI membership, this is open to everyone who has a professional interest in immunology uh, in, in whatever form that they are working. People are welcomed in and have, have equal access to all of the benefits, but also all of the events that we run and to get involved in all of the work that we do from public engagement all the way through to high level policy influencing within the government. We also have a number of groups that, that we've pulled together within the, the British Society for Immunology. Some of these are regional across the UK. Some of them are specific for a particular disease area or, or research area. One of those groups is our comparative veterinary immunology group, CVIG, we call it. And so this is where we're, we're bringing together those with an interest in veterinary immunology and promote and, and with that group, probably an annual meeting is what we're organizing 
partly virtual. Um, it's been over the last couple of years, but now getting back to face to face and sometimes hybrid. And, uh, and these meetings have different themes, but discussing lots of different things that are relevant, sometimes um, uh, within uh, majority within that veterinary space, but actually we do have um, non animal non veterinary researchers coming along and presenting at those groups as well. So really trying to promote that one health approach. We've uh, got good ties with and work very closely with a number of the key institutes across the UK, Perbright and Morden being just two mentioned here. Um, and I'll talk about this example in a second, but we've worked very closely with the International Veterinary Vaccinology Network, the IVVN, which is a network run out of the UK, funded by UKRI, the UK Research um, an innovation um, part of, uh, of the government base, a so government funder of uh, research. And this is really to bring together all of the, the key players in that veterinary vaccinology space, but again, with a, with a, a One Health focus and lens on it as well. And we're also a member of the International Union of Immunological Societies, and they have a veterinary immunology group, which we support. And we have our own BSI Congress that happens pretty much every year, where we bring together about 1500 of our members for four days of immunology, which um, which covers human and animal health. And what's been lovely, we've seen over the last couple of years is that rather than just having um, sessions and, and parallel sessions and plenary sessions on human research and animal research. What we're seeing are, are topics that are coming together with invited speakers and selected speakers that are both from that human and animal research background. So again, trying to promote that One Health approach, that, 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 that pollination, cross-pollination between those two areas and seeing how we can facilitate that two-way learning between the different research areas. So this is the case study I wanted to um, talk to you. Let me just move this screen out of the way. Um, wanted to talk to you about, and uh, I, I thoroughly recommend um, you have a read if you haven't already, but this was a, a report that we pulled together in collaboration with the International Veterinary Vaccinology Network, the IVVN, because both of us wanted to really put a spotlight on this area of research and raise its profile with a number of different audiences, with the policymakers, with the research funders, with industry, um, but also the uh, academic sector as well, with, with one of the aims to try and promote this and, and demonstrate what is being achieved and what could be achieved from, uh, from a career in this area um, of research so that we could bring more of those early career researchers in get more people excited, build the capacity and build our ability to deliver even more within veterinary vaccinology and One Health. Um, so the report is there, it's freely available on our website, please do have a Google. Um, but there are five key findings and recommendations, I would say, that have come out that, that are relevant to the One Health agenda. And firstly, um, couldn't really say it any more clearly, is that we need to prioritise a One Health approach where we do get that two-way learning and, um, and, and exploit the synergies as best we can between the, uh, the areas of research that are so often done in, in a silo between human and animal health. So that's something that was really key and a, and a key finding of the report. We also um, uh, identified that there are a number of opportunities for early career researchers. Again, we wanted to use this to raise the profile of this area of research, uh, but we made some recommendations about what um, could be put in place for early career researchers and how we can encourage more people in and think about that One Health approach. We made it very clear, particularly to the policymakers and to those in industry, that there are significant economic benefits opportunities for UK PLC, but also for others by making sure that we keep a focus on veterinary vaccination and, and that One Health approach. We've called for a uh, need for a long, longer term secure funding. So again, it looks attractive for those looking for a career, but also industry looking to invest here in the UK in particular. Um, we do need to have those facilities, we do need to have things in place that really does support that collaboration and allows things to get off, off the ground and running. And we made it very clear and um, evidence-based that the UK is world leading in this and 
could be even more of a global beacon when it comes to veterinary vaccinology, but also to One Health as well. So um, we're using this report to, we've sent it out to policymakers, to industry, to academics, um, had a, a, a good comms and dissemination plan around this and looking to really promote this as much as we can so that we can, we can create the environment within the UK in particular that allows this uh, One Health and veterinary vaccinology um, field to thrive. So hopefully a, a, a nice explanation of a case study that we've done uh, or a case study of, of, of a, uh, an activity that we delivered at the BSI. So very happy for you to go and uh, get it from our website. Do have a read. It's, uh, it's, it's most definitely worth it. So really my final slide is, you know, where next for One Health, One Medicine and Immunology. And again, I apologies for not being there because I'd love to have been part of the Q&A later on this afternoon. But at the British Society for Immunology, we, we really strongly believe there's a huge opportunity within immunology for One Health, One Medicine, for both human and animal health. And that's bang in our mission, it's bang in our vision, and exactly what we are, are working towards. That said, we feel that there is more that we can do, of course, more that others can do. There's always more that we can do. And I look forward to hearing the outcomes of the discussion today because I would absolutely be taking this back into the British Society for Immunology to see what more we could do to, to promote that collaboration and that, um, that One Health approach within our community and through the influencers and the policymakers that we have connection with. And um, that said, always want and need to do more. We want to be continuing to raise the profile. I think we need to do that as a sector, those that are involved in One Health and One Medicine. We need to support networking and collaboration. I mentioned a few ways that we've done that already at the BSI, but I'm sure there's more that we can do. And the funders, so, Government funders of research, charity funders of research industry, um, would, I, we really need to, I think, have a look at the funding opportunities that are out there and make sure that these funding opportunities allow for a One Health, One Medicine approach um, across the sector, because that is, is quite likely currently a hurdle, but could be a huge facilitator to enable this to happen. So I'm going to leave my presentation there. Um, more information can be found on our website just here. And um, as again, I'm very sorry that I can't be with you virtually live today um, and during the Q&A session, but I hope the Q&A session goes well. I look forward to hearing the outcomes from it. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to send in this recording. It's been a real honour and a real privilege and I look forward to working with you going forwards. Thank you.